Show me the money. This week, we will learn about the healthcare organization's revenue cycle and specifically focus on billing our patients, receiving reimbursement on accounts, either from insurance company payments or patients, and some collection activities. So let's get started. Let's start by looking at the entire medical revenue cycle, from the first point of contact from a patient to receiving payment. The revenue cycle starts when a patient calls to set up an appointment. Basic information is obtained and entered into an electronic practice management program, such as Harris Care Tracker. Typically, the patient is scheduled for an appointment in step one. Step two, the next step, is to establish financial responsibility. What type of insurance does the patient have? What services will be covered under the plan? How will the bill be paid? What is the patient responsible for paying? Step three then, when a patient arrives for their appointment, they are checked into the office in the practice management system. This is where the patient's personal and insurance information is double checked and updated in the computer. A copy of a patient's insurance card is made and sometimes co-payments are collected at the time of check-in. If the patient is new, they may be asked to complete a health history form or other required forms. Step four involves assigning uh, appropriate diagnostic and procedure codes. As we have learned, it's critical that these codes link and make sense. The codes are reviewed for compliance. Steps five, six, seven, and eight are where we are at uh, with our practice management program activities. The remainder of this presentation will focus on learning about reviewing billing compliance, checking patients out of the clinic, preparing claims, and reviewing insurance payments to the practice. Step nine of the revenue cycle encompasses sending statements to our patients for a payment on their portion of the bill. If necessary, administrative staff might need to follow up with payers and patients and even pursue collection efforts if the bill is long overdue. So very briefly, this is the medical revenue cycle. Sometimes it's hard for us to remember, but healthcare is a business. Doctors and organizations are looking for a profit and it's a business. So we do need to look at our billing procedures and remember that. How much does a doctor or organization charge for a specific service? This slide shows an example of a fee schedule for a healthcare organization. The first column shows CPT codes. Remember procedure codes for services rendered during the patient's visit. The next columns show corresponding charges for each procedure code. The usual charge is what the organization will charge for the service. For example, for code 99201, which is an office visit for a new patient with minimal time and effort, uh, this organization will charge $54. Health plans listed on a fee schedule include the plans that a provider participates in. This means they agree to a lower charge due to other benefits they receive by being in the contract. In this example, health plan A and B are two plans this organization participates in. Note the difference in the allowed amount each plan will pay for procedure code 99201. Fee schedules vary from contract to contract. If an organization participates in Medicare, that charge is always lower. Note there are many advantages for organizations to accept Medicare patients, but that's another topic for another day. Note if a patient does not have insurance or does not participate in an allowed plan, the service would be charged from the usual charge column. These are the differences between being a participating provider versus non-participating. There are regulations in place for practices to charge what is called usual and customary fees. In other words, a provider cannot just charge whatever they want. Usual and customary fees do vary by geographic area. For example, the charge for a urinalysis in Wisconsin would be different than the charge for a urinalysis in California or Rhode Island or Alaska. I hope this chart has clarified the topic of fee schedules a bit. If your program requires you to take the Specialized Insurance Claims course, you will learn more about fee schedules in that class. Most medical offices complete their billing and claims electronically. 
When we enter charges for our patients in the Harris Care Tracker system, you will note that a charge is entered for each procedure code separately. Remember, each code has a corresponding charge. Consider all medical codes and charges that have been entered into the practice management program. Lots of data, right? In a practice management program, charges and payments are referred to as transactions. As you work through entering charges, creating claims, and noting payments, note how all the data and information ties together from the patient demographic information to the progress note information to the insurance information it all ties together don't get lost in all the directions steps and clicking critically think about how all this information is coming together to ease the billing and claims tasks for a healthcare organization we can also run various reports to analyze the financial status and efforts of the organization So after we have correctly entered all charges for each procedure or service, we have two choices. One, we can either create and submit an insurance claim form on behalf of the patient, or two, we will bill the patient. This will depend on if the patient has insurance or not, uh, or if perhaps the patient is responsible for paying for the bill first and then getting reimbursed by their insurance company. The medical biller needs to decide what the next action will be to continue with the medical revenue cycle. If an insurance claim is submitted, almost always this is submitted electronically, and most practices submit claims every day. Claims are prepared on a computer and transmitted through high-speed digital lines, just like emails or electronic banking. The advantages are obvious. Claims are transmitted immediately, the organization gets faster payment, and the status of claims can also be tracked, similar to tracking packages with UPS or FedEx. We can see where each claim is in the process. Many companies use a third party uh, to review their claims, and this is known as a clearinghouse. The insurance company or clearinghouse then reviews each claim and determines if they will pay the fee, deny the claim, or pay less than what was charged for some or all of the procedures. This is known as claims adjudication. Just to give you an idea of how many claims we're talking about, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services noted that 4.6 million claims are submitted every day. That's a lot of claims. Before it became the norm to submit claims electronically, a paper claim form called the CMS 1500 was used for many, many years. The CMS 1500 was the universal health claim form, and this slide shows an image of the form. Sometimes a paper claim form still needs to be created and sent. This is typically due to a previously denied claim or a claim that requires more information or an addendum. Medical billers abstract the information from the medical record to fill out a CMS 1500 claim form. Note that not each box is filled out. It's kind of like filling out your taxes. Again, if your program requires a specialized insurance claims course, you will learn more about this famous form in that class. However, you will note the Harris Care Tracker activities that we will build a CMS paper form as we cannot electronically submit claims for obvious reasons. In Chapter 9, when we generate a paper form and choose Paper 1500, this is what we're doing. The system would complete a CMS 1500 paper form. Unfortunately, we will not actually see a completed CMS 1500 in the Harris Care Tracker system. Whether a patient owes all of the charges or some of the charges due to denied services, co-insurance, or co-payment, most patients do receive a statement after they have visited the medical organization. Practice management programs can also automatically create patient statements, otherwise known as the patient bill. Uh, a patient statement is not much different than your credit card bill that shows all charges, any insurance payments, and any outstanding balance that the patient is responsible for paying for. Hard copy statements can be printed and sent via U.S. mail, or statements can be sent electronically, usually through a patient portal module of a practice management system. Note that Harris Care Tracker does have a patient portal, however, it's not accessible in the student version that is used for this class. 
After an insurance company pays its portion of the bill, we might need to bill the patient for denied services. If this is the case, you might be the patient's advocate and that go-between person between the patient and the insurance company, especially if something does not appear correct. Especially medical billing specialists, this might be one of your job duties. Claims can be appealed if the decision does not seem right. Each insurance website would contain information for how to appeal a claim decision. Appealing denied charges can be a tedious job and can take some time to work through, but mistakes can be made, and if the decision does not seem right, it can be appealed. Okay, we have entered charges and submitted an insurance claim, right? Assuming the claims adjudication finds we have submitted a clean claim, meaning there are no errors or red flags, what comes next? Hopefully payment. We're working through with that medical revenue cycle. Again, we will have payments from insurance companies and payments from patients. Co-payments might be collected at the time of check-in at the desk or might be billed after the service. If you are the front desk receptionist, you might be collecting money and providing receipts to patients. Patient bills are mailed monthly until payment is received. Some doctors work on a cash-only basis. Consider plastic surgeons who perform cosmetic surgeries and services that would not be covered by insurance. This is one example. Some patients who have an outstanding bill may be seen on a cash-only basis that would be collected at the time of check-in or check-out from the clinic. A field would be checked in the practice management program, which would flag a, per, a patient as a cash-only patient. Here's a little terminology about payment options. For this slide, think back to the fee schedule slide earlier in this presentation. The allowed amount is the most an insurance company will pay for a specific procedure code. From the previously reviewed fee schedule, remember that allowed amounts do vary from health plan to health plan. The allowed amount is usually less than the usual charge. When the amount the physician charges is more than the insurance company's allowed charge, the difference is absorbed either by the patient or the physician. If the patient is billed the difference between the usual charge and the allowed amount, this is known as balance billing. This typically happens if the provider does not participate in the patient's insurance plan. This would be an example of an out-of-network provider. If the physician does not charge the patient and absorbs the difference, this is known as accepting assignment. This is part of the contract of being a participating provider. They accept the allowed amount as payment in full for patients holding that insurance, and they cannot bill the patient for the extra. Let's look at an example. Taking the urinalysis charge from earlier, let's say the usual charge for the urinalysis is $20, and the insurance company's allowed amount is $15. The organization is short $5, right? If the patient's insurance is one the provider participates in, the provider or practice must absorb the $5 shortfall. They cannot bill the patient the extra $5 because this is part of the contract. If, however, the provider does not participate in the patient's insurance plan, the $5 can be billed to the patient, known as balance billing. Delinquent accounts would be what are known as aging accounts, accounts not being paid either by an insurance company or patient for over 30 days, 60 days, 90 days or more. We may need to set up a payment plan for our patients if they are unable to pay their balance. Just remember that communication is key here. Make a phone call or send a collection letter. Practice management programs can automatically print and send collection letters. Some very overdue accounts may be sent to a collection agency, although it's very expensive to do this. If a medical biller needs to set up a payment plan for a patient, be aware that it may fall under the Truth in Lending Act of 1960. If a practice adds finance charges and the number of payments is more than four installments, the payment plan falls under this law. This is really no different than a car loan, for example. The organization is required to disclose the total amount of the loan, finance charges, due dates, and the amount of each payment. Note that when an insurance company pays on accounts, the payments are sent in batches, not individual checks for each patient account. 
Several patients' charges may be paid for in a batch. There could be hundreds of patients' accounts payments in the batch. Again, these payments are typically made electronically through electronic funds transfers. When insurance payments are received, the medical biller would verify the payments against the charges and identify the patients in the batch to apply payment to their account. When an insurance company pays on a patient's account, usually the patient receives an EOB or an explanation of benefits. You've probably seen these from your own insurance company. EOBs traditionally have been a paper form sent through the U.S. mail, although of course technology changes are changing the way patients receive EOBs. An explanation of benefits provides information on what the insurance company paid or what they denied and what the patient owes and why. They might have uncovered charges. This is known as an explanation of benefits. A remittance advice, or RA, is similar to the EOB that is sent to the patient, but is usually sent electronically to a physician or healthcare organization. It contains the same type of information, what charges the insurance company paid, what was denied, and an explanation of why. In Harris Care Tracker, we will refer to explanation of benefit forms to enter insurance payments to our patient accounts. See the examples in Appendix A. Be sure to carefully review these explanation of benefits forms and note the different columns, such as the amount charged versus the allowed amount by that insurance company. Again, the most that the insurance company will pay. Be sure to enter the correct column information into Harris Care Tracker. And note that the procedure codes lines may be different than what is showing in Harris Care Tracker, so be sure you're entering the correct information for the correct code. Let's take just a minute to open up your Harris Care Tracker textbook in, uh, to Appendix A, Source Document 9-2. So pause this for a second if you need to. Open your textbook to that Source Document 9-2 in Appendix A, and let's take a quick look at just a couple of these explanation of benefits for a little bit more information. So Source Document 9-2 is an explanation of benefits for Jane Morgan. And we can see the first column there, uh, like 99212, that's our procedure code for an office visit. The amount that was charged for that was $112, and uh, the amount that was allowed was $76, and that's that because uh, the doctor is participating with the Blue Shield Cengage plan. Note that the entire $76 is going to go to our patient, and we might think, well, why is that, right? But if you look at that adjustment reason code, says 22, and if we look at it, it says that the patient has not yet met the annual deductible. So the patient is actually um, going to be in charge of both of those charges on this claim because they have not yet met their annual deductible. Let's flip our page um, and let's take a look at source document 9-4 here, then for Ellen Restino. And I'm not gonna go through each line here, but when we look at the last two lines, we'll see we have these adjustment codes here as well. And the first one uh, needs a modifier, so it's going to get kicked over to the patient. That might be something that we might consider appealing if we can add an addendum with our modifier here. Uh, and code 20 then is not a covered charge, so something was done that wasn't covered by the plan. So the patient at this point is in charge of both of those. Those are denied charges, and that's how they would be entered into the Harris Care Tracker system for that one. If we look at source document 9-5 then for Craig Smith, um, this is a Medicaid claim here, and so the just looking at our first line here, the amount charged was $112. The adjustment was, uh, the amount allowed then by Medicare is 33, or Medicaid, sorry, Medicaid is 33, so it's usually quite a bit less. Notice that the patient does not have a deductible or copay, probably because it's a Medicaid uh, plan, and Notice that none of this is going to go over to the patient. The patient isn't going to be responsible for any of this. Again, it's because it is part of the contract 
that they've contracted that that organization is going to assume that extra money that wasn't covered by the Medicaid plan. So just a few examples of how to read those explanation of benefits. Again, be careful about how you enter them into Harris Care Tracker. Take care of using the correct uh, column of information, the allowed amount allowed column is going to be entered. And again, be careful that you're double checking that the procedure code matches uh, the line on the explanation of benefits versus the Harris Care Tracker uh, fields. As we work our way through the revenue cycle, continue to think about these steps. In your new career, you might be part of one step of this cycle, or you might play a part in all of these steps. For example, a healthcare receptionist may be involved in steps one and three, while a medical office manager working in a smaller office, such as a chiropractic office, might, for example, uh, be involved in all of these steps. It will depend on your job and the organization in which you work. Thank you for learning more about the revenue cycle and billing in the medical office.